Hello, everyone. I'm Bob Goulder, contributing editor with Tax Notes. Welcome to the April edition of In the Pages, where we take a closer look at some of the recent content from our print and online publications. Well, this month, we've done something a little bit different. We actually have two featured articles that we're going to profile. And the subject matter will be something that's very familiar to you. In fact, you see it every day on the news. We're looking at the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, should the package of uh, U.S. economic sanctions extend to tax policy? Specifically, should the Biden administration terminate uh, the U.S.-Russia tax treaty? Well, interesting question. There's certainly uh, a lot there to consider, including the impact on taxpayers who've presumably done nothing wrong. Uh, to help us sort through all this, we have some exceptional authors. Uh, first, we'll be talking to David Morse, Tax Policy Director with the Coalition for a Prosperous America. Uh, his piece is titled, Going Beyond a Simple Treaty Withdrawal. Uh, with that in mind, let's get started. David Morse, welcome to In the Pages. Thank you very much, Robert. Now, here's the thing. Um, the readers of tax notes are going to think that tax treaties are pretty important things, and so do big corporate multinationals who rely on them. They can reduce withholding taxes, they can relieve double taxation, and we like to think in our little world, these are really important things. But something tells me that the Russian dictator Vladimir Putin just doesn't care about tax treaties. Um, with that in mind, what is the, the argument which you've raised in your piece uh, for terminating this treaty? If it's not going to deter Putin's aggression, why do it? Right, well, once again, thank you for having me on. I, you know, I have to agree with you. It's not going to affect Putin. I mean, if you look at what he's been willing to sacrifice for a military victory and the amount of unfortunate and horrific death on the part of Ukrainian civilians, uh, to think that a simple track tax treaty withdrawal will even blip on his radar is incredible. You know, I just don't think that it's, um, it's something that we can think will have an effect, but that doesn't mean that we have to fund Putin's war. And what I mean by that is you're absolutely right, and you explained it, tax treaties smooth the system. They, they make trade and financial transactions easier between the two countries. And, uh, you know, but in my opinion, it's, it's like a trade benefit. And certain trade benefits don't need to stay around when you have an aggressor, an, a nation that invades an ally, destabilizes a region, and commits atrocities. So if you look at it, you're actually looking first at the idea that you're signaling the rest of the world. You're telling them, we do not accept this. Even if we have a pre-existing agreement, there is something that we expect out of you out of that agreement. There was a, there was a promise, it's implicit, but in the US-Russia treaty uh, on tax, the promise was that Russia would be a peaceful partner in the global economy. I mean, we encouraged production in Russia by American companies to produce goods that ended up getting sold back to the United States. Now, I have my own issues regarding that, considering reshoring, but we thought that would be enough to check the authoritarian tendencies. Obviously, we were wrong, and now we have to deal with those consequences. But if you even go beyond that symbolism, as the end of the treaty comes around, the tax benefits on US source dividends and related party interests end for Russians. Now, when you think about who is actually investing in our country, the these are probably the kleptocrats. They're the most likely beneficiaries of these benefits as they currently stand. Uh, we're not talking about the Russian middle class mostly, and that's actually a rare thing for economic sanctions. Many times, unless you specifically target and name a person, the generalized economic sanctions many times hit the everyday Russian person. So geopolitically, I think this is a wise policy. Uh, it means less money flowing into the upper echelons of the Russian government. And I think that's a good thing. You've made that case very well. Now, the title uh, of, of your article, though, is going beyond a mere 
treaty withdrawal, which brings up the issue of, well, what else can we do? And there are these foreign tax credits out there. Uh, readers of tax notes will be pretty familiar with how foreign tax rules work. Uh, the question there is, should they be denied? If a, if a US taxpayer, a, a business say, has paid Russian taxes, can they claim that as a credit against the US tax liability? Some say that resembles an economic subsidy and you have to be careful who you're subsidizing. So, so what do you say? Um, is it worth looking at disallowing foreign tax credits? I think it is. Um, I mean, I know most of uh, the viewers will know what a foreign tax credit is, but I want to go back to what the purposes are of a foreign tax credit, um, just in the more simplistic sense that they both serve the larger concepts of free trade. The first being to avoid double taxation uh, that results when a US worldwide system could impose taxes on profits that were already taxed in another country. Uh, the second purpose is to smooth the system with the secondary country so that we are not going after the same base. We're effectively abdicating that tax base to them because we're trying to smooth the trade between the two. I, it is supposed to incentivize free trade and I was taught in my econ classes going way, way back that this would stop wars. Now, I think this fits into the ideas of the, what has the US done in the past regarding this? And the US did create the state sponsor of terrorists um, that denies foreign tax credits to specific nations under, I believe it's the IRS code 901J. Uh, this is a very specific list that has additional consequences and it exists for an era when we thought direct nation to nation battles and wars would be relatively rare. And we were more interested in international terrorism um, and the countries that would support international terrorism rather than going head on into war. Uh, it, effect, it effectively denies those countries the funds uh, from the United States through foreign tax credits. Because once again, like you said, there's this concept that we're effectively subsidizing them when we do that. So if they are an enemy, we don't wanna be doing that. And while the terrorism concern, I don't think has gone away, it's now, we're, we've now become hyper aware that direct nation to nation war is not only possible, it could become prevalent and even worse that uh, it always directly impacts the United States because we're so involved all around the world. I would point out that uh, Senators Wyden and Senator Portman, uh, they propose draft legislation that denies the tax credits and deductions to companies that continue to operate in Russia and Belarus. Uh, these would be foreign tax credits and the ability to use uh, those taxes paid also in the guilty calculations, the uh, global intangible low tax income. And so I do think that we're subsidizing Russia when we provide those foreign tax credits. And normally that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if they were play, uh, playing by the regular rules, but I think that they've abandoned it and we've been abandoning the tax base to them. It's time to change that. I will also say that something that I noticed in the legislation was that they were very clear that they were distinguishing it was a special rule for Belarus and for Russia. This was gonna be a special rule. And I think that's the right call. I think it's important that they're not labeled state sponsors of terror because that's a different terminology and I don't want it to be confused. Now, I personally think that we need a new category so that we're alerting the world that we are paying attention. And I would use something along the lines of uh, invading and destabilizing nations as a category. But regardless of what you call it, this I think this is a step in the right direction. Well, personally, I happen to agree with you, but uh, I'll let you in on this story. I, I was having a conversation very similar to this with a respected colleague, and she made this comment to me. She said, well, you gotta be careful about weaponizing uh, tax policy. Uh, after all, if, if we say that reducing double taxation is a, is a good idea and that should be in our tax treaties and it should be in our tax laws and, and sort of part of this international consensus, don't we need to worry about um, straying away from that concept? If it's the right concept, um, 
then we have to worry about saying, well, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Uh, not being contextual, just being absolute. Um, so I don't know. My, my, my thinking on that is that we're talking about tax treaties and they're sort of inherently political. I mean, the current treaty that we've got between the Russia and U.S. goes back to the early 90s. It, it, it doesn't go back to the Soviet era. This was during the first President Bush uh, and while Boris Yeltsin was the leader of Russia and saying, hey, we want to have a new modern tax treaty with you to encourage trade. That, that's kind of like a carrot, right? You know? Uh, rewarding them for good behavior and trying to incentivize future good behavior. Well, the flip side of a carrot is a stick. So on one hand, you have this idea that um, uh, the, the goals of, of, of reducing double taxation are absolute and that we shouldn't weaponize them. But I wanted to get your take on that. Right. And I've also heard the theory that tax policy should remain agnostic. Um, and I don't think it's uncommon uh, because the tax policy world, many of us are trying to find the most efficient way the, to gain revenue for the state while at the same time not impacting business activity. Uh, you know, prior trends, especially I think prior trends, aspire to stay above the freight and, and prioritize that avoiding that double taxation you mentioned, uh, almost no matter the consequences. Now, I'm going to have to admit that I do the same. Um, but I'm doing it on the tax fairness for domestic corporations. And I'm continuing the previous work by Reuven Aviona, Kim Klausing, and Bill Parks and sales factor apportionment. As professionals, we all start from the idea that we can create a better tax system for all seasons. But here's where the rubber hits the road. And I think that it's once you start thinking that tax can be perfect rather than perfected, you have a problem. You're forgetting that tax policy will always be imperfect because it's a human activity and human beings are frankly messy. Uh, and once you accept that it's a human activity, then it kind of becomes inhuman to accept war atrocities as the price of doing business, as the, uh, that the tax system must remain above such things. And I think the state sponsor of Terror List is a great example of using the stick. We've done it before. And we've used the tax trees as carrots in tax. And it's not only Russia. But I think right now, unfortunately, because we're not living that fear and that danger that our allies are facing, it's seductive to want to go to the cheap goods and ignore the pain that all these other countries are facing, not just Ukraine, but everybody who's worried that they're next. And I don't think that the tax system and free trade, the purpose wasn't to carve out American production or even just to get cheap stuff from overseas. I think those were byproducts. The core of the free trade argument, the one that I was always taught was it's supposed to stop wars. Now I've heard two sides on the, of that coin from a pro-globalized perspective. You know, I understand the impulse to avoid weaponizing taxation. But that's in a short term theory. In the long term, I'd argue that if you truly believe that globalism has not failed and you think that the Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine is a outlier, you have to treat it like an outlier. You have to respond as if it's an outlier. And that includes additional discouragement for any others who would attempt military invasion and causing further damage to the concept of a peaceful global community. Now, doing nothing or calling for Ukraine surrender, as I've seen a few people do, uh, that won't shore up the status of that globalist argument. To me, it detracts from it. Now, if you wanna believe that we're in the start of a post-global or regional or deglobalized era, you're talking about taking the same approach, but you're doing it for a different reason. You embrace the tax policy that cannot remain agnostic because the real world events will affect it. And by not changing it until it's too late, you have a problem. You're accepting that the geopolitical policy does not always include the rational man when you're dealing with autocracies and tax policy should respond accordingly. I'm going to completely admit I'm in the second camp, but I was taught and believed the first for a long time. So I see both sides of it, but we have weaponized tax before 
And the only difference this time is that we're talking about a larger trading partner that we invested time and money into for decades. And unfortunately, I think we're going to have to listen to Kenny Rogers, the gambler, when we when he says, yeah, no, I have to, when you have to know when to fold them and you have to know when to run away and walk away, especially from a bad hand, no matter how big that pot looks. Very well said. Now, one of the things you mention in your article is that uh, last year, Congress passed a piece of legislation called the Corporate Transparency Act. And I'm reminded of that in the context of the Russia-Ukraine situation, because we always hear about Putin uh, and perhaps other kleptocracies around the world taking advantages of anonymous shell companies in sort of the murkier corners of the global economic system. If you could work us through here, what did that legislation accomplish? Uh, and did it go far enough in your eyes? Right. So. I'm kind of glad that you mentioned other kleptocracies as well, because yes, the Russian kleptocracy isn't my only concern. They're just the problem at hand. They're emblematic of the consequences when we foster a system rooted in secrecy. So thinking long-term, we have many foreign interests investing and de facto controlling US property and interests. Our over-reliance on secrecy encourages the investment that may harm our national security interests in my mind. So. I think it's clear I like cutting past uh, traditional procedures if I feel they hamper our national interests, which is why I reference the fact coalition and why I find their perspective so enticing. So we need to know where the foreign interests might wield power over us and entrench their own potential problematic methods of power through completely anonymous U.S. investments. Anytime a financial investment is made in the U.S., that's the power to influence because there's always the threat, that threat that the foreign investor might take that money away and it can entrench and grow a potentially adversarial power as we're seeing via the Russian oligarchs in real time shocks to the US financial and governance systems. So you mentioned the Corporate Transparency Act. Early last year, it was passed as part of the National Defense Authorization Act. And this legislation, thankfully, if effectively banned anonymous shell companies. But the problem in any law is always funding the enforcement, the efficiency of the agency, and the exceptions. The agency that needs to create all the needed rules and enforcement, it's the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, known as FinCEN, and it's not gotten the needed funding it needs to do. So that's led to delays and time for the Russian kleptocrats to continue to benefit. We know that set of, a set of proposed rules is currently in the works, and we're hopeful that final rules will come by the fall, but you, know, you have to wait and see how long everything takes. The exception to the Corporate Transparency Act includes private investment funds, um, many private equity funds, hedge funds, venture capital funds, and they're completely outside of any money laundering regime and certain operating businesses that don't otherwise report beneficial ownership and information, and many trusts or common law partnerships. So we have weaknesses that we left with the anti-money laundering accounts, even for real property reporting. So I think that's a problem because some US states, you know, I, I don't blame them. They saw the benefits of providing secrecy to gain foreign investment assets and said, why, why should the foreign tax havens have all the fun? They created laws that benefit secrecy. I, you know, once we don't deal with it, internationally, we still have the problem. So, but we still have this lack of knowledge and it impacts our national security. Uh, we can't have foreign investment interests without a clear picture of who has influence. So the strongest way that I saw provided was to register this information and have clear due diligence obligations for the professionals that's talking accountants, lawyers, trustees, formation agents, art dealers, and many others who should be asked and made to register the beneficial ownership. So we're talking about closing these loopholes and the Corporate Transparency Act has to be made timely, strongly stood up. And I would say that this, this, there are gonna be people that oppose it. Everyone who benefits from secrecy, um, many professionals advertise or rely on word of mouth that in fact, uh, you can trust our discretion. But the problem is I'm afraid they're trading on a privilege that the US can no longer afford. I think that some very wealthy US investors might also rely on this discretion and they would not be happy to lose it. And while we could initially limit the reporting to foreign interests, 
we would also be creating a significant incentive for a black market of unofficial American straw men investing on behalf of foreign agents. So for that reason, I think it's preferable to fully apply the due diligence requirement. And then many of these foreign investments will be dealt with, especially the ones that are bound back to authoritarian structures of their home country and our free market system should not be subservient to those. I think your point about the uh, cottage industry of American straw men is a, is a very good one there. So thank you for sharing that. Now, uh, last question for you before we move on. Uh, right now today, if you had President Biden's ear, uh, what would you tell him uh, about countering Putin's aggression in terms of tax policy? One thought. My temptation here is to immediately run to sales factor apportionment and argue that taxation on pure destination-based territorial system would remove all, most of the underlying issues for tax policy. Realistically, uh, Ukraine is not a problem that will be resolved with just one tax or trade policy. I'm not sure Russia is ready for a prolonged NATO war, but I will admit I'm worried the US isn't ready either. Ukraine needs a strong United States and a strong NATO to keep them armed and to help the Ukra Ukrainian refugees supplied, fed, housed, so I think I'd start with, um, Mr. President, you, you campaigned on Build Back Better. You realized there was inherent weakness in our capabilities and COVID proved you right with the brittle supply chains. Please prioritize a return to the arsenal of democracy, tax policy, trade policy, and economic policy that prioritizes domestic companies and domestic production. Arsenals are not just weapons, they're also the support structures for food, supplies, and the supply chains for critical resources. Right now, we do have inherent weaknesses. If we were cut off from critical resources, we'd have to prioritize ourselves over Ukraine. Now, that would be my statement. I think the administration actually sees these issues. I think they're actually working on them. But they also, I think they're also trying to result to half measures to not jolt the system. But if a recession is coming, like people are predicting, and higher domestic production with a purpose can only be a good thing for that. And increasing American production to provide you for Ukraine seems like a strategic and beneficial investment to me. So I'd advise them and the rest of Congress to emphasize and speed up reshoring of critical supply chains, especially from potential adversaries. There you have it. The author is David Morris, Tax Policy Director of the Coalition for Prosperous America. The article is titled Going Beyond a Simple Tax Treaty Withdrawal, and you can find it in the Tax Notes archive. David, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Want more like this? Subscribe for more tax videos. Special thanks to our executive producers, Jasper Smith and Paige Jones, and showrunner and video editor, Jordan Parrish. <laughs>